ventilated patients lose many of the essential homeostatic mechanisms that protect the lungs against damage. An essential component of looking after patients on mechanical ventilation is humidification. In this video, we'll review this important preventative measure. In health, the upper airways almost completely saturate inhaled room air prior to it entering the trachea. The inspired air is also effectively warmed by the upper airways, and on exhalation, much of this heat is retained. It has been reported that up to 250 mils of water can be lost per day from the respiratory tract when breathing dry air. Appropriate heating and humidification of inspired air is essential to the normal defence mechanisms of the airway. Important mechanisms, such as airway cilial transport and mucus production, depend on a warm and moist environment. Mucociliary transport appears to cease when exposed to air with relative humidity of less than 50%. Application of mechanical ventilation bypasses the upper airways, such that without appropriate efforts, inhaled air will be dry and relatively cold, subjecting the patient to potential harm. Dry circuits lead to drying and cracking of the respiratory epithelium, a failure of the mucociliary transport system, inspissation of secretions and respiratory infection. Failure to humidify inspired gas can also increase the risk of endotracheal and tracheostomy tube obstruction due to caking with secretions. Dry gases such as oxygen can be so damaging that many authorities recommend humidification, even in spontaneously ventilating patients who are receiving supplemental oxygen at rates greater than 4 litres per minute. A number of methods for ensuring heating and humidification exist. Essentially, these fall into two groups, active and passive. Active humidification involves a device inserted into the circuit that actively creates humidification of the air by exposing it to a reservoir of sterile water. The process of humidification is enhanced by warming the water and the gas. Two basic forms include the bubble through and the flow by mechanisms. In the former, the airflow is actively bubbled through a diffuser in a chamber of warmed, sterile water. They are limited by the flow that can be facilitated, so are generally not suitable for mechanical ventilators. In the latter mechanism, the airflow passes over a bath of heated, sterile water, picking up moisture and warmth as it goes. The addition of a thin, permeable, adsorbent material known as a wick significantly increases the efficiency of this type of humidifier. Active humidification can be applied to spontaneously breathing patients through face masks and nasal prongs, through to intubated mechanically ventilated patients and patients with tracheostomies. Active humidification is recommended in patients who require high flow supplemental oxygen greater than 4 litres a minute, in patients who are intubated and tracheostomized more than a few days, patients with thick or tenacious sputum or hemoptysis, and patients who are hypothermic or dehydrated, and those who are managed with a negative fluid balance, for example in neurosurgical patients. Humidifying the circuit can result in condensation forming in the tubing, a phenomenon known as rain-out. Rain-out has been suggested as a potential source of microorganisms that can lead to ventilator-associated pneumonia. To combat this, some circuits include a heating wire that prevents gas cooling and condensation subsequently from forming. Rain-out should never be allowed to drain back into the humidifier as this exposes the patient to potential infection. It may also increase resistance to the circuit, interfering with ventilation, be accidentally aspirated by the patient during turning and even trigger the ventilator, an event known as auto-triggering. 
passive methods involve the insertion of a specialised filter that traps heat and moisture from the exhaled breath and returns it to the inhaled air mixture as it passes through the filter. These devices are known as heat and moisture exchangers, or HMEs. These have been designed to fit into the circuit as shown here, or for the use on a tracheostomy tube in a spontaneously ventilating patient. The latter is known as a Swedish nose. The advantage of HMEs are that they are cheap and easy to use and are very useful for short periods of ventilation. However, as their use is prolonged, they lose efficiency and can progressively increase the resistance to gas flow. HMEs also add weight to the tube that can be a factor in pressure ulceration and tube dislodgement, and they add dead space to the circuit, which can be important, particularly in children. HMEs are therefore suitable for patients who are only expected to be intubated for short periods, or for patients at the very end of their tracheostomy weaning program, for example, ward-ready patients. They are not suitable for people who have high sputum loads or homoptysis. Because HMEs rely on heat and moisture of expired gas, they are less effective in hypothermic and dehydrated patients. These patients are more appropriately treated with active systems. Additionally, in patients with higher tidal volumes and respiratory rates, there is less time for the HME to be effective. HMEs may also interfere with the administration of interventions such as nebulised medications. Active systems are more effective at warming and humidifying inspired gas, but add cost and complexity to the process and are more difficult to transport. While HMEs have been associated with lower risks of ventilator-associated pneumonia, patient selection bias limits interpretation of these studies. Current evidence suggests that contaminated gas is unlikely to be a significant cause of ventilator-associated pneumonia, and no difference has been detected in VAP rates between the two forms of humidification. Active systems may have the potential risk of overhydration, hyperthermia, electrical and thermal injury. Aggravation of bronchospasm in patients with reactive airways disease is another suggested risk, particularly if the air is not adequately warmed. The potential for ventilator-associated pneumonia to be transmitted to the patient via the ventilator circuit has led to the development of a bacterial and viral filter. These disposable filters have also been used to prevent contamination of the ventilator and of the surrounding environment through the gas of the return limb in the circuit. If used correctly, many filter manufacturers quote rates of removal of more than 99% of pathogens. Filters contain material that effectively removes solid particles such as pathogens while allowing the relatively unimpeded flow of gas. Filters are broadly described as either mechanical or electrostatic. The former act by physically preventing larger particles such as pathogen-laden water droplets from passing through the barrier. The latter contain polarised fibres that help trap microscopic airborne pathogens. The efficiency of the filters is tested using a high-efficiency particulate air or HEPA test, with higher HEPA values indicating lower rates of penetration by pathogens. Filters are available as standalone items and can also be incorporated into HME systems. A surprising lack of evidence is available to provide definitive recommendations on their value, while evidence supporting their use is lacking, most institutions have a policy that promotes their use. Protecting the patient from iatrogenic injury due to intubation and ventilation is essential for good clinical care. Providing the patient with humidified, warmed and clean gas is a fundamental component of this.